morning, East Vancouver Community Church. Thank you for being with us this morning online. Um, would you um, uh, would you worship with us this morning together? At your name, the mountain shake and crumble. At your name. So we're introducing a new song today. Some of you might know it, others might not. But if you know it, please sing along. If you don't, you can listen along too and try to sing along too. Hope you enjoy it. It's ringing in the skies like cannons. 
Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ryan and Riley. Forever my heart will sing of how great you are. Good morning, church family. This, uh, we're going to enter into our prayer time right now. And I'd like to share some from the World Evangelical Alliance publishing, as this is the day they declared as a global day of prayer and fasting. The world is full of fear and anxiety right now as people struggle to make sense of the potential threats to their physical and economic well-being. The best comfort secular governments can offer is an assurance that they are working on the problem and an encouragement to remain calm, rational, and kind to one another. Yet, human nature being what it is, people are too easily consumed by self-preservation, panic, Purchasing at grocery stores reveals how little we are naturally concerned about the needs of others. This should not be so with followers of Jesus. We do not copy the behavior and customs of this world. Instead, we have an opportunity to shine like bright stars as we respond to our circumstances like Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit, living and serving in perfect peace. That begins with coming into and remaining in the presence of God. Church family, I know that you're sitting at home right now. Maybe some of you are standing. Maybe some of you are walking around as this is playing on your computer or playing on your TV. Can I encourage you to enter into and stay, remain in the presence of God? Would you pay attention to this right now? I'm going to share with you Um, how it is we're supposed to enter in and to remain in the presence of God with belief. The prerequisite for calling on God is belief. With humility, in weakness, confessing our need of God and sins that separate us, realizing that he is higher and we're submitting our hearts to him. With desperation, Earnest prayer is powerful in its effects. Do you, got, you want God to hear your prayer today? Would you please pray with earnest? Pray with desperation, with expectation that God will hear and rescue, with confidence that God will hear and respond positively, with awareness that we are not alone, but part of all the saints crying out to him around the world with gratitude, alert and thankful for the goodness of the Lord, and finally, with peace. With peace, not anxious for anything, but trusting God in all things. Then one night the Lord appeared to Solomon and said, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this temple as the place for making sacrifices. At times I might shut up the heavens so that no rain falls or command grasshoppers to devour your crops or send plagues among you. Then, if my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and restore their land. My eyes will be open and my ears attentive to every prayer made in this place. For I have chosen this temple and set it apart to be holy, a place where my name will be honored forever. I will always watch over it, for it is dear to my heart. East Vancouver Community Church family, let's practice this 
entering into the presence of God, remaining there and crying out to him. As we join saints around the world today on this day of global prayer and fasting, let's let him hear our voice on behalf of our community, on behalf of the state of Washington, on behalf of the world. Let's cry out to him together. Father, I come to you practicing belief. I believe in you, Lord. I'm trying to come to you with a humble heart. I'm coming to you with a humble heart, realizing that, man, I'm nothing without you. I submit my heart to you this morning. Father, to be completely honest, I don't know that I'm coming to you with enough desperation. Father, would you teach me to be more desperate for you? Would you teach me to come to you in desperation, realizing that, that only you have the answer and only you are able to meet us at our need? Father, I do come with expectation, realizing that you hear me and that you rescue. I come with confidence. I come with awareness that I'm not alone. I come with a grateful heart, Lord God, and Father, I come to you with peace right now, realizing that you are the author of peace. Father, we as a church family, Lord, those who are watching online, you know that we're online streaming, Lord God, because we're not able to gather right now physically because of what's going on in our community, state, and country, and world. And so, Lord, we are crying out to you together, asking that you would heal our land. God, would you please bring healing to our land? Would you please remove the coronavirus? Lord, would you please bring healing to those who are sick with it right now? Father, those families who have already lost loved ones because of it, Lord, I pray that you would bring comfort to them. But God, I pray that you would save our community. I pray that you would save Clark County, Washington State, our country, and save our world, Lord God, from this pandemic outbreak. God, at the same time, Father, I am asking in more earnest, Father, I do ask in earnest that you would bring healing to physical bodies, but I ask in more earnest, Lord God, that during this time that you would set hearts and eyes upon you. Father, would you bring, would you, would you cause this pandemic outbreak to turn hearts to you and say, clearly we are in need of a Savior. Father, would you help the world to cry out to you and that you would glorify yourself and help people come to know you. 
Jesus, I pray that you would continue to do the work in our body of Christ at East Vancouver Community Church. Father, would you bring the physical healing that we need? But Lord, I also pray that you would bring the spiritual healing that you that we need. Father, I pray that you would help our hearts to be earnest and seeking you together. I pray that you would help our hearts to be close to yours and that we would walk with you every day and that you would use us as the salt and light that you've called us to be. Father, we need you and we love you and we give our hearts and our bodies, our minds to you today. In Jesus' mighty and precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's sing one more song. online this morning that you would fill their houses with your presence and Lord please uh, speak through my dad this morning and Lord thank you that we get to praise you Lord this morning Lord we love you amen 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 well good morning again church family thank you so much for being online with us this morning it is a pleasure to be able to, I really mean it, it's a pleasure to be able to be with you online and to be able to share God's word with you uh, in this way now that we are, um, now that we're not able to gather uh, physically right now. I'm very thankful for how God has been preparing us for this time uh, with our technology and, and online streaming. So thank you for, for gathering this morning in this way. If you have your Bibles... If you don't have your Bible, get up out of your easy chair, get off the couch, and go grab your Bible or go grab your phone and make sure that you have your Bible. We're in Hebrews chapter 7 this morning. 
Um, go ahead and, and uh, whatever game you're playing on your phone right now, go ahead and stop that. Whatever, uh, whatever's distracting you, I want to encourage you to uh, try to limit those distractions at home. Hey, I, I know what's going on. I know what's going on. Um, but anyway, try to limit those distractions uh, because God has a word for us this morning. God has a word for us this morning. Hebrews 7 is where we're going. I do have just a couple of announcements as it relates to the body. So uh, congregation care plan. I want to let you know, church family, to be expecting a phone call from someone in the congregation. They're going to be asking you four questions. Um, this is a part of our congregation care plan that we're starting, and there's people who are uh, going to be making phone calls to care for the body. So everybody, every family is on the list to receive a phone call, and uh, the questions are simply, how are you? How are you since the last time, last time we've spoken? Because this is something that's going to continue. Uh, the second question is, how can I be praying for you? The third question is, can I share a scripture with you? And then the fourth question is, do you have a word from me? Based on 1 Corinthians 14, 26, that says, when we come together, each one has a psalm. Each one has a lesson. Each one has a revelation from God. And so, and so I just want to um, prep you for that um, for those who have not got the phone call yet, but um, we are doing this to care for one another in the body. Separate from that, separate from that, uh, during this uh, pandemic outbreak on Tuesdays and Thursdays, our seniors are going to be are receiving phone calls um, from, from various people, but it's primarily youth happening right now. Youth are calling our seniors and asking, is there a need that we can meet for you? And then how can we be praying for you? And so uh, seniors, um, I, I think that you, this has been a blessing to you already. And I just wanted to let you know that that's going to continue um, in the weeks ahead as we are in this season of, um, of caring, needing to care extra for one another during the coronavirus and then finally, as you already know, uh, today has been proclaimed as a global day of prayer and fasting by the World Evangelical Alliance. And so I just want to, I want to encourage us as a church family to make sure that we're taking part in this somehow, and not just the few minutes of prayer that we had during the service, but um, is there a meal? Are you, are you fasting the whole day? Are you, are you uh, skipping one meal and fasting and praying? What are you doing to fast during this day and, and pray and take extra time that you would normally take to cry out to God on behalf of the world? We are God's children. Therefore, this is, this is something good for us to be a part of <laughs> as, as Christians around the world are fasting and praying on behalf of uh, what's going on in our world right now and asking for God to heal our land. Okay, those are the announcements I had for you. In our family room, we have a huge painting of a horse that Rebecca's mom gave to her because Rebecca loves horses. And um, this, this painting, this painting, I'm gonna refer to it as a picture, but it's a, it's a painting. Um, it's shadowy. You can't really see the, the, you can't see the face of the horse. You can just see a shadow of the horse. You can kind of see the outline. You can see the outlines of, of, of its ears, and you can see the white mane and, and kind of outline of the, of the right eye there. But it's a, it's a picture. In our passage of Scripture this morning, the writer wants us to see a picture of Jesus while understanding that the picture that he's giving uh, as he points to people in, in the Bible, as he points us to people and, and events, the picture that he's giving is, is kind of like uh, a picture that we see, uh, that I think that you see on your screen, this painting that's shadowy. Um, you can see the outline, you can see, you can see what it's supposed to be, but it's just a shadow of what is. And the, the writer is, is giving us a picture. It's only a shadow. That, the picture is only a shadow to, to point us to the real thing. That's where the writer is taking us this morning in Hebrews 7, 
And so I'm going to read for us Hebrews 7, starting in verse 1, going through verse 10. It says this, This Melchizedek was king of Salem and priest of God Most High. He met Abraham returning from the defeat of the kings and blessed him. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. First, his name means king of righteousness. Then also king of Salem means king of peace. Without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, like the Son of God, he remains a priest forever. Just think how great he was. Even the patriarch Abraham gave him a tenth of the plunder. Now the law requires the descendants of Levi, who become priests, to collect a tenth from the people, that is, their brothers, even though their brothers are descended from Abraham. This man, however, did not trace his descent from Levi, Yet he collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. And without doubt, the lesser person is blessed by the greater. In the one case, the tenth is collected by men who die, but in the other case, by him who is declared to be living. One might even say that Levi, who collects the tenth, paid the tenth through Abraham. Because when Melchizedek met Abraham, Levi was still in the body of his ancestor. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you for uh, the power that your word brings to our lives. Holy Spirit of God, I ask that you would just lead us now and teach us and, and help us. Help us, um, help those online watching, help us to get out of your word this morning what you want us to get and continue to make us into the men and women of God that you desire us to be. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. So the last three weeks, I just want to refresh us, the last three weeks as we've been marching through Hebrews, uh, three weeks ago, uh, Hebrews had a message for us of it's time to start eating solid food. It's time to start eating solid food. The writer told the hearers, you're dull of hearing, and you need to start eating solid food. And then two weeks ago, the, the, what came out of the passage was don't be lazy in your spiritual growth. Growing in Christ results in a useful crop. And then last week, your hope is secure. Your hope is secure. It's time to start eating solid food, so don't be lazy in your spiritual growth. Why is this? Because your hope is secure in Christ. Christ entered before you and anchors your hope in God. Now, now, as it relates to being in Hebrews 7 this morning, the author comes back to what he was wanting to talk about in the middle of chapter five regarding Christ being designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Back in chapter five in the middle, he, took a, he stopped right there of what he was saying about Melchizedek and said, man, it, I have so much more I wanna say to you, but it's hard to explain because you're dull of hearing. <laughs> You've stopped even trying to understand the things of God. Church family, let this not be true of us. Let, let, me, let, let me point a little bit more closer to you. Let it not be true of you that you stop trying to understand the things of God. And so the, the writer of Hebrews is bringing us back now to the things that he's wanting to tell us about Melchizedek. Why? Because Melchizedek gives us a picture of Jesus Christ. Melchizedek gives us a picture of Jesus Christ. So from our passage of scripture this morning, I'm gonna give to you three things about Jesus, okay? Three things about Jesus. Here we go, the first one is this. Jesus is the author of courage. Jesus is the author of courage. For those paying attention at home, you're like, I don't understand, Randy. Uh, I didn't see that in the passage at all. Well, well, Good thing we're talking about it. Let's go to the scripture here. Verse one, verse one says this. This Melchizedek, okay? That seems like an awkward way to start off a chapter, doesn't it? And so um, why does he start off with this Melchizedek? Well, because in chapter six at the end, he just ended with Jesus has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Now in verse one, chapter seven, he says, this Melchizedek was king of Salem, and priest of God Most High, he met Abraham returning from the defeat of the kings and blessed him. He met Abraham returning from the defeat of the kings and blessed him. I'm not going to 
assume that you remember this story, okay? When Abraham went and defeated kings. And so I'm going to turn in my Bible to Genesis 14. And I would encourage you to do the same at home if you're able. But Genesis 14, starting in verse 14, uh, just 14 through 20, you're just going to read a few verses here to get us up to speed of what the writer is telling us about, about Melchizedek and as it relates to him meeting Abraham, okay? Genesis 14, starting in verse 14. Let's see, it says this. When Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, okay, his relative Lot lived near Sodom, and it was, it was overtaken by some kings. So when Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he called out the 318 trained men born in his household and went in pursuit as far as Dan. During the night, Abram divided his men to attack them, and he routed them, pursuing them as far as Hobah, north of Damascus. He recovered all the goods and brought back his relative Lot and his possessions, together with the women and the other people. After Abram returned from defeating Kedor Lomer and the kings allied with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Shava, that is, the king's valley. Then Melchizedek, okay, here we go. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God most high, Melchizedek was. And he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God most high, creator of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Wow, this is, okay. It takes courage to lead a group of people out to, uh, well, it takes courage to lead a group of people, period, but it takes courage to lead a group of people out to attack another group of people. Abram, though, had trained fighting men, 318 of them, in his own family that was born in his family, 318 that he took with him. It also takes courage to act in the darkness. They were in the darkness, they divided up, and they, they conquered. It also takes courage to fight the enemy. Randy, how do you know that this was, that this was done? Um, you know, the, you're saying that Jesus is the author of courage and, and this is somehow you know, done pleasing to the Lord. Well, yeah, absolutely, I, I believe it was pleasing to the Lord. Um, for one, we have Melchizedek that's coming out and blessing him. Melchizedek is priest of God Most High. But for another, Abraham is helping his relative who is in need. There's somebody in need here. So I'm going to take you to, just to, just to help you with this, I'm going to take you, us to Psalm 41. I think it's going to be on this. Oh, it, it's actually not on the screen, but, um, but if you want to turn there. I'm going to read it to you, though, just the first few verses. Psalm 41 says this, Blessed are those who have regard for the weak. Another translation says, Blessed are those who have Help the helpless. But blessed are those who have regard for the weak. The Lord delivers them in times of trouble. Who does he deliver? Those who have regard for the weak. He, the Lord delivers them in times of trouble. The Lord protects and preserves them. They are counted among the blessed in the land. He does not give them over to desire of their foes. Blessed are those who have regard for the weak. It is so cool that Abram went and rescued his, his nephew Lot. And then, and, and then they, they come back, and on the way, uh, Melchizedek, the priest of God Most High, comes and blesses him and reminds him that the Lord is the one who handed his enemies over to him. I encourage you to look up Psalm 41, verses 1 through 2, uh, sometime soon. But let me ask you a question, church family. Where are you needing courage today? Courage is not being in a state of no fear, but courage is, even in the face of fear, you continue knowing that God is with you in every circumstance. Even in the face of fear, you continue doing what you know you need to do or what you know God is asking you to do, even when there is fear, because you know that God is with you and he's gonna carry you through. It takes courage, church family, to lead yourself. Where are you coming up with that one, Randy? Well, 
uh, here we are in a pandemic outbreak, and, and, and our, our routines are different. Many's, many routines are, anyway. Many people's routines are different. Some people are stuck at home. Some people just have different routines as, as it relates to their essential work. But it takes courage to lead yourself. Are you continuing to lead yourself in the way that God wants you to lead? Even when your routine is different? It takes courage to lead your family. So those families who are watching right now, it takes courage to lead your family. Some of you were probably tempted to not sit your kids down and, and watch today. Oh, I don't know what they're gonna feel about me by making them watch. And, and be a part of the church family. I, I, that's a little bit nerve-wracking for me. I don't want them to, to not like me. I don't, want them to be, I don't want there to be awkward feelings. Friends, it takes courage to lead your family. Moms and dads, act in courage. Lead your family. Jesus is the author of courage, and he wants you to have courage to lead your family. It takes courage to act or move forward when you can't see ahead. We can't see ahead right now. I'm not sure when we could, but we can't see ahead. We don't know when the coronavirus is going to end or, or, or we can't see ahead, but it takes courage to act or move forward when we can't see ahead. It takes courage to help those in need when you are at risk yourself, doesn't it? Yeah, you know that it does. It takes courage to help those in need when you are at risk yourself, and yet, when the need arises, when somebody else has a need that we can meet, I absolutely believe that that's what God expects us to do as Christians, as Christ-like followers of God. God wants us to be people of courage. The Bible says, for the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. It's a nice thought, Randy that God has given me a spirit of power, love, and self-control. That's a nice thought, but it's not my experience. To that, I would say, if it only stays a thought for you and not something you practice, then you're right. It will not be become part of your experience. I want to take you to a psalm, Psalm 27. I'm, I'm going to start calling this psalm a psalm of courage, a psalm of courage, Listen to this psalm, Psalm 27, a psalm of courage. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life, and whom shall I be afraid? Now start listening. Listen to what he, he's talking about, the fears that are coming against him, the enemies that are coming against him. Verse two, when evil men advance against me to devour my flesh, when my enemies and my foes attack me, well, Let's, let's insert something else in there. When the coronavirus advances against me to devour my flesh, when the virus attacks me, verse three, though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though the coronavirus besieges me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then will I be confident. How? How will he be confident? Oh yeah, he gives us, he gives us the answer in verse one. Verse one says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? What shall I fear? Shall I fear the, the enemy that might break into my house? Shall I fear COVID-19? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? You don't have to be afraid, dear loved ones, because God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but he's given us a spirit of power and love and self-control. I'm, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be wise in, in making smart decisions to, to not get sick. Make smart decisions to not get sick. But at the same time, when God expects you to follow him in doing things that might to the world look, look a little bit risky, if it's something that the Lord is leading you to, to love somebody else, take courage. Even in the face of fear, take courage and, and follow Jesus. When we bless people for their courageous acts, we are giving people a picture of Jesus. 
When we perform courageous acts that line up with the word and spirit of God, then we are giving people a picture of Jesus and our world needs a picture of Jesus. Jesus blesses acts of courage done for him because Jesus is the king of righteousness and peace. And so the second thing I want to give to you about Jesus today is this. Jesus is the king of righteousness and peace. Look at verse two with me. Hebrews chapter seven, verse two says this. And Abraham gave him, who? Melchizedek. Abraham gave Melchizedek a tenth of everything. First, Melchizedek name means king of righteousness. So Melchizedek literally means king of righteousness. That's his name, what his name means. Then also king of Salem means king of peace. So Melchizedek, king of righteousness, and then the fact that he was king of Salem means that he's king of peace. Uh, he, was, he was king of a place, but it means king of peace. It is fascinating that throughout the book of Hebrews, the author is pointing us to one person. <laughs> I, I trust that you have given, gotten that as we are now in Hebrews 7. Man, if you haven't gotten that by now, you need to find a different pastor. I'm, I'm serious. But the book of Hebrews points us to one person. That person is Jesus Christ. So here in chapter seven, the author once again takes us back into the Old Testament to show us yet another way that God foreshadowed Jesus Christ. Now, foreshadow is simply a big theological word that means an event or person that gives us a picture of a future event or person to come. So think about this with me of how incredible the parallels are in this account of Abraham and Melchizedek, okay? Abraham's nephew, Lot, so we're, go, we're, we're thinking back to Genesis 14 that we read. Abraham's nephew, Lot, is kidnapped by the enemy. These foreign kings, Abraham gets his little army together, 318 of them, to go rescue him, okay? Think about the parallel here. We were kidnapped by the enemy, and someone came to save us. His name was Jesus, Okay, Abraham is on his way home when Melchizedek greets him with bread and wine. Think about this parallel. When Jesus came to save us, he gave us the true bread out of heaven, and he gave us wine from heaven, his own flesh and blood. Not only did Melchizedek give Abraham bread and wine, but he also gave him a blessing, saying, Blessed be Abram by God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. When Jesus was giving us our bread and wine, his flesh and blood, he blessed us by saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Which leads to the further blessing when he said, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Praise God. Randy, those are spoken to specific people, you're right, and yet they have application for us, don't they? He forgave us from our sins when we confess our sins to him. And those who are following Jesus, whenever, as soon as they die, those who follow Jesus, they will be with Jesus in paradise. Friends, we need to grow in blessing people. We as a church family need to grow in blessing people. Blessing them, speaking words of encouragement, speaking words of blessing to them. Then we learn from this verse, verse two of Hebrews seven, that Melchizedek means king of righteousness. We know that Jesus is the true king of righteousness, for the scripture says, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Now we know from other scripture that the law was not abolished, but Jesus was the fulfillment of the law. And so when this scripture says that for Christ is the end of the law, not as if the, uh, um, that he put it away, but he fulfilled it. He fulfilled it. What does that say? For righteousness. Jesus is righteousness to everyone who what? Who believes. Jesus is righteousness to everyone who believes. Then we learn also from verse 2, Hebrews 7, that king of Salem means king of peace. We know that Jesus is the true king of peace. For the scripture says, for to us a child is born. To us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. You've heard this during Christmas time, haven't you? And his name shall be called, what? Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. 
Okay, so what's the big deal with Jesus being king of righteousness and peace? Well, let's make sure we connect this with the context of the book of Hebrews. Are you still awake in your easy chair right now? Hey, uh, hey, on the couch or at the dining table or in your bed, are you still awake? Hello, yoo Hello, family. That was funny for those who got it, but... Uh, 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 teenagers, would you inform your, your parents or, or your grandparents what just happened just now? Okay. The Hebrews, let's make sure we get this in context of the book of Hebrews. The Hebrews, those who are being written to, are tempted to leave their Christian faith to go back into a religion that is, uh, isn't. They're, ba- they're, <laughs> they're being uh, tempted to go back into a religion that isn't being threatened by persecution. Okay, They don't want to be persecuted, therefore they're threatened, they're, they're tempted to go back. They like to be in a religion that offers them righteousness and peace without the stress of facing threats. Unfortunately, that would result in going back to a religion of void of Jesus. Let me put it another way. These Hebrews are tempted to go back to a way of life that is safer for them based on grow, the growing threat of persecution for Christians in their time. And what is the writer wanting to teach the Hebrews? He is teaching them that the only way, please get this, friends, this matters for you. The only way to receive the righteousness and peace that we need before God, the righteousness and peace that we need to be in right relationship with God is to continue to keep Jesus, the true high priest, that lasts forever, Jesus, because only Jesus is the true king of righteousness and peace. Does this hit where we're at today? Absolutely. So let me spell it out for you in case you're not getting it. We are living in a time of unrest, panic, and stress. No, this is not based on a growing threat of being persecuted as Christians, at least not yet. Although that will happen in the future. I'm not prophesying here. I'm reading my Bible. That will happen in the future that we will be persecuted more and more as the day draw nears for being Christians. But we are living in a time that is tempting for us Christians to get comfortable in a way of life that is safer for us. Are you hearing me as you're sitting on your couch? (laughs) I'm not picking on you for sitting on your couch. But this fits, okay? We, we happen to be in a time that we can't get together physically. So what are you doing as you're watching a pastor preach? You're sitting on a couch or an easy chair or, or just maybe you're eating breakfast. We are tempted, we're, we're, we're gonna be tempted to stay in a way of life that is safer for us and more comfortable and therefore retreat from the very commands that God our Savior gives us. And what, it, what are those commands? To love God by loving people in such a way that it makes very tangible for them to see who God is and that he loves them very much. We must continue to act in a way that shows people who Jesus is. The only accurate way of showing people that Jesus is the king of righteousness is not to try to be perfect. That's not where we're going with this. But by coming to and submitting ourselves to the only one who is perfect, his name is Jesus Christ. One author says that God is not perfecting me to be a specimen in his showroom. I love that, and I said I had to offer that to you because I, th- I feel that I, I was once there. He's not perfecting me to try to put me in his showroom. But then my friend, Pastor Brad Bigney, says, people who live under the weight of a self-made perfectionistic standard are constantly thinking about themselves. They're so consumed with measuring themselves that there's no time to fix their eyes on Christ. And so there's precious little energy and emotion left over to invest in the kingdom by serving, loving, and thinking of others. Friends, God wants people to see Jesus in the midst of this coronavirus pandemic outbreak. Jesus is the king of righteousness and peace. I really appreciated Superintendent Randy's um, blog. 
um, this week. And, and so I, I put a picture of it up on the screen for you in case you didn't see it. I, uh, I posted it on our uh, East Vancouver Community Church, uh, Church Facebook page. And um, man, it just, it just hits home. He gives us four things in this blog of, of the, the silver linings of the coronavirus. Um, real quick, here are the four things. You, you can read it for yourself later, but these four things are powerful and I believe true. The, the four things during this coronavirus crisis, it, well, number one, it exposes our idols. It exposes our idols. Number two, it gives us more opportunities to share Jesus. Number three, it forces us to be more creative. And number four, it leads us to rethink our priorities. Do, are you realizing that? I trust that you are. Um, please, I, I encourage you to go to this blog. It's on our Facebook, East Vancouver Community Church Facebook page. But God wants the world to see Jesus during this coronavirus. God wants the world to see Jesus during this coronavirus. So I'm having te te technical difficulties right now pulling up my notes, and so that's, that's kind of a problem. But um, <laughs> let's see here. Ryan, will you grab me my paper copy of notes, please? I don't know what happened. Oh, um, nope. I still need it, bud. I still need it. Thanks, bud. Okay. Well, look at there. Technology. Isn't it awesome? It is. I love it. I love it. People need a peace that remains, and therefore it gives us peace to know. It gives us peace. People need peace. You know that. You need peace. Our community needs peace. The world needs peace that remains. Therefore, it gives us peace to know that Jesus remains. Jesus remains. Look at verse 3 with me. Hebrews 7, sorry, in verse 3. Without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, like the Son of God, he, Melchizedek, remains a priest forever, okay? What is this verse saying? Well, without father or mother, without genealogy. Is the writer of Hebrews saying that Melchizedek didn't have a mother, a father or mother? That he didn't have a genealogy? Is that what the writer is saying? That he was somehow a special human being or maybe not even a human being? No, that's not what the writer is saying, so let's not go there. <laughs> The writer is simply pointing out the fact that all we know about Melchizedek from the word of God is that he was king of Salem. And along with being king, he was priest of God most high. From the scriptures, we don't know about his parents or his genealogy. That, that account that I read to you from Genesis 14, that is the only account we know of about Melchizedek from the word of God. That's the only account that the word of God speaks about him, uh, about his person, of what he did here on earth. And then every other reference, there's only one reference in Psalms, Psalm 110, where they're talking about uh, the, son, the son of God being a priest in the order of Melchizedek. And then the rest of Melchizedek is in Hebrews, where they're pointing us back to, look at Melchizedek, look at Melchizedek. Why? Because he gives us a picture of Jesus Christ. From the scriptures, we don't know about his parents or his genealogy. But according to F.F. F. Bruce, historically, Melchizedek appears to have belonged to a dynasty of priest kings in which he had both predecessors and successors. F.F. F. Bruce goes on to say, although to the writer of Hebrews, the silences of scriptures were as much due to divine inspiration as were the statements. Did you catch that? The silences of the scriptures, what the scripture doesn't say about Melchizedek is as much divine inspiration as what the scripture does say about him. Nothing is said of his birth and nothing is said of his death. The scripture goes on to say in verse three, 
in, in, in Hebrews 7, like the Son of God, Melchizedek remains a priest forever. The writer is pointing, pointing that from the, the Scripture's point of view, there was no ending to Melchizedek being a high priest. From the Scripture's point of view, there was no ending to Melchizedek being a high priest. In fact, he then goes into verse 4 saying, just think how great he is. Whoa, 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 wait, wait. Why in the world, why in the world does the writer of Hebrews tell us to think how great Melchizedek is? Look. Continue reading in verses 4 through 6. Verses 4 through 6 says this. Just think about how great he was. Even the patriarch Abraham gave him a tenth of the plunder. Now the law, the law requires the descendants of Levi who become priests to collect a tenth from the people, that is, their brothers. Even though their brothers are descended, are, are descended from Abraham, this man, however, did not trace his descent from Levi. Melchizedek did not trace his descent from Levi. Yet he collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. Okay, stay with me, stay with me. Abraham paid Melchizedek a tithe, ten the tenth of, 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 of what he had. The law required just the Levites to be paid a tenth, okay? The law required just the Levites to be paid a tenth. Melchizedek, though, is not a descendant of Levi, and yet Abraham paid him a tithe. But think about this with me. That's not all. Abraham is back in the time frame of 2100 B.C., very roughly, 2100 B.C., the law was given to Moses on Mount Sinai somewhere around 1440 B.C., again, very roughly, meaning the law that God's priests, the Levites, would collect a tenth from the people was still around 700 years from being given. The law had not been given. Abraham gave a tenth uh, 700 years before the law was given that the Levites would receive a tenth. And Abraham is given a tenth of Melchizedek. Thus, the scripture says in verse 9, one might even say that Levi, who collects the tenth, based on the law, you must give the Levites, the priests, a tenth. One might even say that Levi, who collects the tenth, paid the tenth through Abraham because when Melchizedek met Abraham, Levi was still in the body of his ancestor. Levi had not been born yet. In fact, 700 years <laughs> For 700 years, Levi would not have been, uh, that would, the law would not have been given to Levi. Again, I ask the question, why is the writer of Hebrews wanting us to think how great Melchizedek was? Well, as we look at the Bible, it speaks a lot of things being great. By the way, I, I want to just do a refresher reel here. Are, are you still paying attention? Remember uh, in chapter 5, he says, I have so much to explain about this. <laughs> I have so much to explain about this, yet it's hard to explain because you're not trying to understand. Please continue to try to understand. He's telling us about Melchizedek because it gives us a picture of who our Savior is. Remember that Savior who died on the cross to save you from your sin? Yeah, we're talking about him right now. As we look at the Bible, it speaks a lot of things being great. Great lights, uh, sun, moon. Great sea creatures that God made. Great cities, great nations. It's also very clear the Bible describes that there are great people. After describing people that had great faith, it says of them, the world was not worthy of them. The world was not worthy of who? These great people. They had amazing faith. They had faith in God and caused them to do these things. Yes, it is clear that when people show the character of God, coming out of them, along with great faith that is combined with that. The Bible describes these people as great people. So it is true that the writer of Hebrews wants us to see that this Melchizedek, king of Salem, who Abraham paid a tithe to, he was a great man. But don't miss what the writer of Hebrews is wanting you to really see. He's wanting you to really see something. You, you can feel it coming, can't you? Jesus is better. Jesus is better. Jesus is better than this mysterious king of righteousness and peace. 
because Jesus, the true eternal king of righteousness and peace, Jesus remains. Jesus remains. Your circumstances that you are going through right now will not remain. The pain you are going through right now will not remain. The depression you are experiencing right now will not remain. The broken down body you have, the broken relationships you may be experiencing, the broken economy that is impacting your retirement accounts, the coronavirus will not remain. Praise God. But you know what does? Jesus remains. And because he remains, you too shall remain. Because he lives, we shall live. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. How about you? In fact, that reminds me of a song. I bet it reminds you of a song. I'm not going to break out in song, but I am going to read a few lyrics. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. Praise God. Jesus is without beginning. Jesus is without end. He will always remain, and it is him that God is wanting the world to see. So let's give people a picture of Jesus. Let's give people a picture of Jesus. How do I do that, Pastor Randy? How do I give people a picture of Jesus? Well, I'm not going to go through the whole thing right now of how you give people a picture of Jesus, but this is, what, this is the first step. You draw near to him. Are you drawing near to Jesus? Are you focusing your eyes, your thoughts, your hearing, your heart, your actions on Christ? Because it's him. It's him that remains. And those who love him, those who follow him, they're going to be okay because they will remain with him forever in heaven someday. No, he does not promise that this life will be easy. He does not promise that you can have more comfort in this life. He does promise that if you will follow him, if you will live with him now by drawing near to him through the word of God, through prayer, by, by, by seeking his presence now, that you will have the peace and security and the hope of living with him in paradise someday in the future. Because he lives, you can face tomorrow. Because he remains, you can have hope today because the coronavirus is not going to stay around forever. I don't know how long it is going to, but what I do know is this. All these things that are around us right now are going to pass away, but Jesus will remain, and he's going to make all things new. He's going to make all things right, and he is just continuing to beckon his church. He is beckoning his church. Church, this is the time you need to rise up and keep your eyes and your heart on me. For I am the answer. I've always been the answer. Will you point the world to me? Because people need a picture of Jesus. And so you draw near to him today. You continue to seek his face. And guess what will happen? Your character will start changing. Yes, he does not want you to stay the same. He wants you to change. He wants your grumpy attitude to go away. And he wants to put a smile on your face and a smile in your heart. He loves you. He loves you so much that he accepted you just the way you were. But he loves you so much that he will not allow you to stay the same. And so draw near to him, and he will change you as you spend more and more time in his presence. 
And he wants you to give a picture to the world, to the people around you of who he is. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for showing us Melchizedek so we could see a shadow of who you are. Lord, would you cause us, those who are sitting at home right now, would you, would you cause us to draw near to you? Would you help us draw near to you? And would you help us to, to, um, to change? Thank you that we don't have to work harder, but we simply need to spend time in your presence. Thank you that, that it's not based on uh, everything that we do, but it's based on you and spending time in your presence. Thank you that you're the one that causes the change. Lord, change us and make us a picture of the Jesus that the world needs to see. Amen. Amen. We're, gonna, we're going to uh, take communion together now, church family. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn to a scripture that I'm going to read for us, and then I'm going to put down, um, well, maybe I don't need to put down the microphone. But it's time now at home. It's time now at home to get your bread and your juice um, and, and distribute it to your family, okay? I'm going to distribute it to my family, and I encourage you to go ahead and distribute it to your family right now. Hopefully you have uh, some bread and juice uh, right now. If not, uh, that, that's okay. Um, but we're, we're practicing taking communion together. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this. Whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many among you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we judged ourselves, we would not come, or come under judgment. When we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. Praise the Lord. Would you please follow me in a prayer at home? Would you please follow me in a prayer? I'd like for you to speak this out loud. Follow after me. Lord Jesus, I prepare my heart to take communion. As I remember your death on the cross for me, Holy Spirit, please search my heart and see if there be anything not pleasing to you that I need to confess. Now listen. If the Holy Spirit brings up anything in your heart that you need to confess, go ahead and confess it. Give it to Jesus. For Jesus says, if you confess your sin, I am faithful and righteous to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Hallelujah, we have a Savior that forgives us. Hallelujah, we have a high priest that is merciful and he reigns forever. He will always be your high priest. And so we confess our sin to him and he forgives us. 
He says, as far as the east is from the west, so far have I removed your sin from you. And so, dear sinner, you don't have to be feel guilt anymore. Dear sinner, you don't have to feel dirty anymore, for Jesus forgives you if you will only give your heart to him. If you will give your sin to him, he'll forgive you, and he makes you clean. And so, Jesus, thank you for saving us. Thank you for forgiving us. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and take the bread. The bread represents Jesus' body given for you. Take and eat. Thank you, Jesus, for your body. Thank you, Lord. Take the juice. The juice represents Jesus' blood given for you. Take and drink. saves. Jesus' blood flowed so we could be clean. Let's praise him, shall we? Your fear doesn't stand a chance when you stand in his love. The world is needing a picture of Jesus. So let's draw near to him together. He loves us. He's a merciful high priest that remains forever. You don't have to fear because he's broken those chains. Church family, we're here for each other. You can contact, we can contact through email, through, through phone or text. But I wanna encourage you to have a great week Draw near to Jesus this week.
Let's meet needs as we are able to meet needs for each other and for our community. Let's give the people around us a picture of Jesus. I love you. Have a great rest of your week.